Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. To sum up, we have looked at three sets of investigators who were employed by the McCanns to search for Madeleine for the year from September 2007 to September 2008. Gary Hagland's speciality was money laundering. Metodo 3 was a thoroughly disreputable detective agency who were frequently involved in or suspected of criminal activity. Halligan was an out-and-out -out fraudster and liar, another criminal. Three Metodo 3 men who worked on the Madeleine McCann case, Francisco Marco, Julian Parabenez and Antonio Gimenez Rasso have all spent time in jail following allegations of criminal activity, one of them, Gimenez Rasso, being in jail for four years. Kevin Halligan was also jailed for four years. None of these agencies or individuals unearthed one single usable fact about who might have taken Madeline or where she was. Between them, the McCanns probably paid them a total of well over £1.5 million, with absolutely no result. Where is the mainstream media's coverage of these extraordinary facts? Nowhere. This brings us back to the reason why Clarence Mitchell, the head of Tony Blair's media monitoring unit, was appointed to the job of being the head of PR for the McCanns. He once boasted to a Spanish magazine, L'Espresso, I was the head of the 40-strong Central Office of Information media monitoring unit. My job there was to control what comes out in the media. Enough said, I think. After the McCann team sacked Halligan in August or September 2009, Brian Kennedy turned to two local contacts to head up the McCann team's investigation. One was former Detective Inspector Dave Edgar, who lives in Crewe, just a few miles from Brian Kennedy's mansion. The other was another retired police officer, Arthur Cowley, who lived in a hilltop cottage on Halkin Mountain in Flintshire, North Wales. Their main activity over the next three years seemed to have been to promote a series of unlikely stories about who might have abducted Madeleine, which I'll look at in a moment. But first, let's look at yet another deception perpetrated by the McCann team in relation to these men. In truth, they were men local to Brian Kennedy, handpicked by him to work in his investigation office in Nutsford, Cheshire. But Kennedy and the McCann team tried to pass the two men off as heading up an already established and successful private investigation agency. They chose to mislead the press and the general public in thinking that Dave Edgar was the boss of a successful detective agency called Alpha Investigations Group. There was only one problem with this. There was no such detective agency. It was just two men chosen by Kennedy and working completely under his direction. It was not what it seemed. But the McCann team's strategy was brilliantly successful. The mainstream press simply lapped up the misinformation coming from the McCann team's PR men. In a moment I'll explain how this deception was perpetrated, but first let's look at the way mainstream press simply recycled the McCann team's deception over Alpha Investigations Group. One of the first mentions of this bogus Alpha Investigations Group came in the article in the Belfast Telegraph on the 13th of September 2009 and in a parallel article based on the same source in the Independence Sunday Life magazine. The article claimed that Sunday Life can now lift the lid on how Edgar's Alpha Investigations Group private eye agency really operates. Renowned for leaving no stone unturned in his UK murder investigations, Dave now spends his days with a four-strong team probing every lead that comes into his office. The article referred to his business partner, Arthur Cowley. This was no lifting of any lid, it was simply the media printing what the McCann team was telling them about Dave Edgar. 
In fact, it is us here at Rich Planet TV who are now lifting the lid on this and all the other things about this private investigation that have been deliberately hidden from the public until now. It was, however, back on the 14th of May 2009 that the Daily Mirror first mentioned the bogus Alpha Investigations Group. The article praised Edgar to the skies for being one of the most brilliant detectives Britain has ever had, citing his alleged work in solving the murder of Gary Newlove. The Mirror then told us that Edgar found himself at the heart of several successful murder investigations in Cheshire, whatever that might mean. The Mirror then told its readers, Mr Edgar now runs the Alpha Investigations Group with business partner Arthur Cowley. In a Daily Star report a week later, the McCann team's PR spokesman Clarence Mitchell was quoted as saying that Mr Edgar is following a potentially vital new lead. For operational purposes, I cannot say where Mr Edgar and his team are exactly, but they are following up a very encouraging lead. Mr Edgar believes Maddie could be hidden in peasant villages close to the Algarve resort of Praia de Luz, where she was snatched. Mitchell misleadingly referred to Edgar and his team. It was not Edgar's team, it was Brian Kennedy's. Then the Independent on the 23rd of May chipped in with a long article by Cajal Milmo. Once again, Edgar and Cowley were portrayed as amongst the most dedicated and brilliant detectives in the land. Milmo then claimed, newly retired detectives and their uniformed counterparts are entering the nebulous and lucrative world of private investigation such as those running the Alpha Investigation Group, the company headed by former detectives Dave Edgar, 52, and Arthur Cowley, 57, which has been employed since last year by the Find Madeline Fund. Pausing there, the Independent in this one sentence has claimed two key things. One, that there was a company called Alpha Investigations Group, and two, that the Find Madeline Fund was employing this company. Other media quickly followed suit. On the 26th of May, the thisischeshire.co.uk news website referred to Dave Edgar and Arthur Cowley, the duo who now run the Alpha Investigations Group. The previous day, the Daily Telegraph had claimed on the 25th of May, stating, The search for Madeline is now being headed by two retired policemen, Dave Edgar, a former RUC and Cheshire police officer, and Arthur Cowley, previously of Merseyside Police, who run Alpha Investigations Group. One newspaper even referred to a claim that the McCanns have used the company since some time the previous year, i.e. 2008. These claims essentially portrayed Alpha Investigations Group as a long-established, successful private detective agency headed by Dave Edgar. None of it was true, as we shall now see. These are the facts. 1. There never was a company involving Messrs Edgar and Cowley called Alpha Investigations Group. 2. A company with a similar name was, however, formed several weeks after all these stories appeared in the press. 3. It was called Alfag, not Alpha Investigations Group, and was formed on the 16th of June 2009, nearly five weeks after Alpha Investigations Group received its first public mention in the mirror. 4. Alfag was formed as a one-man band company with Cowley as the sole director. 5. The base of Alfag was not in Cheshire, as claimed in the mainstream media. It was Arthur Cowley's home in the Flincher Hills. 6. In fact, Edgar and Cowley were operating from Kennedy's office in Nutsford. 7. Dave Edgar, who was portrayed in the mainstream press as the director of this allegedly successful company, in fact had nothing to do with it. He was neither the owner, nor even a director, nor even a shareholder. 8. Alfag had no employees. 9. Alfag has never had any presence on the internet. 10. Alfag had no assets to speak of. 11. There was no evidence that Alfag had ever traded. 12. Alfag never had an office. Apart from Edgar and Cowley using Kennedy's Nutsford House, its registered address was Treetops, Pant a Goff, Halken, Flincher, CH8, 8DH. 13. The company was numbered 0692937 and incorporated on the 10th of June 2009. 14. Its sole owner was Arthur John Cowley. There is no mention of Dave Edgar being involved with this company at all. We can also demonstrate that the McCann team were actually behind the creation of Cowley's Alfag company. On the 12th of January 2009, a full five months before Cowley's company was registered at Company's House, the domain name alfag.co.uk was registered by one Andrew Dickman. It turned out that he was a business partner of Brian Kennedy. 
the Manchester Evening News said on the 21st of May 2007 that a property business owned by Shale Sharks and Everest double glazing chain tycoon Brian Kennedy has secured a £60 million funding boost for expansion. Patrick Properties was established in 2002 by Mr Kennedy and Managing Director Andrew Dickman. May be using his friend and business partner Andrew Dickman to register this domain name was meant to conceal the involvement of the McCann team and Brian Kennedy in setting up the bogus Alfig company. Well, if so, it hasn't worked. As so, we have established that all the media stories about Alpha Investigations Group are untrue. Amazingly, Edgar himself admitted this by stating that he was not part of Alpha Investigations in what was a highly critical article about the Madeleine McCann private investigation published on the 15th of August 2009. This was a story about the McCann team searching for an Australian woman who looked like Victoria Beckham. It was one of the most ridiculous stories the McCann team ever produced, so let's have a quick look at it now. It was, for a start, a story or a lead to which the McCann team attached great importance. They even held a special news conference to promote it. It was so important that the McCann's chief reputation manager, Clarence Mitchell, chaired the press conference, with their lead investigator, Dave Edgar, present as well. They had maps and artist sketches at the ready. We might note, first of all, that this latest lead is said to have taken place in Barcelona the HQ of the dodgy Spanish detective agency Metodo 3. The outline of this story ran as follows. A British businessman, said to be a banker, has been agonising for two years about an encounter he had on the dockside of Barcelona, Spain, three nights after the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Now, after two years of agonising, he had come forward. Not to the police, but to the McCann team. He said that he had been drinking in Barcelona's bars for several hours that evening. Indeed, one newspaper described him as a stagnite reveller. At two o'clock in the morning, a woman with an Australian accent had approached him. She asked him, have you got my new daughter? He said, no. She looked a bit like Victoria Beckham. It was suggested that Madeleine might have come on a boat from Portugal round the Mediterranean to Barcelona, and that the woman was arranging to meet a man on the Barcelona dockside so that she could take her as her new daughter on a yacht to Australia. And that was it. On this slender foundation, the McCann team organised a press conference at which dozens of journalists and cameramen turned up. Edgar claimed it was not only a lead, but a strong lead, and indeed this story prompted a worldwide alert and search for the woman in Australia. Let us now turn to the damning criticism in the Mail on Sunday of this little episode. Days previously, an earlier article by Jerry Lawton had proclaimed that Detectives hunting missing Madeleine McCann are to quiz the skipper and crew of a £6 million super yacht. The move came after its millionaire owner, Rhonda Wiley, 52, and daughter Melissa Carlson, 31, vowed to do all they could to help. The 105-foot yacht was spotted in a Barcelona marina three days after Madeleine disappeared in 2007. The vessel, flying an Australian flag, was moored close to where the Aussie Posh Spice lookalike approached a Brit stagnite reveller and muttered, are you here to deliver my daughter? But Tom Warden, Martin Delgado and Andrew Chapman in the Mail on Sunday took apart this so-called strong lead. They said private detectives leading the hunt for Madeleine McCann faced questions last night after a Mail on Sunday investigation revealed shortcomings in chasing a strong lead. Edgar's Detectives 1 failed to make even rudimentary inquiries before announcing a significant development in the worldwide search for the six-year-old. 2. Failed to speak to anyone working at the seafood restaurant near where the alleged agitated woman was seen at 2am. 3. Failed to ask the Port Authority about movement of boats around the time Madeleine disappeared. 4. Failed to ask if the mystery woman had been filmed on CCTV. 5. Knew nothing about the arrival of an Australian luxury yacht just after Madeleine vanished until told by British journalists who gave them the captain's mobile number. 6. Failed to interview anyone at a nearby dockside bar where, according to Mr Edgar, the mystery woman was later seen drinking. And 7. Failed to ask British diplomats in Spain for advice before or during the visit. Also, Spanish police could not confirm that they had ever been contacted by the British investigators. The Mail on Sunday attacked Edgar's failure to question several people who might have had vital information before calling a news conference. But then maybe dramatic news headlines were all that the McCann team really wanted from the story. The Mail on Sunday spoke to Jose Luis Lopez, 
owner of the El Rey de la Gamba restaurant where the mystery woman was seen. He said the McCann's private detectives did not make any inquiries at my restaurant. I am almost always here when the restaurant is open and my staff would have informed me if anyone had approached them about such an important matter. You are the first person to ask about this Australian woman. The manager of the bar next door, Kennedy's Irish Sailing Bar, said the same. The Barcelona port director, Juan Guitar, asked about it. He said, Nobody has been here asking questions about Madeleine for this Australian woman. This is the first I have heard about any possible link to the port. A senior port authority worker added, There are several security cameras monitoring the port, but we have not been approached about footage from the night in question. I would have expected anyone carrying out the investigation to at least have asked about it. A source at the British Embassy in Madrid said, the detectives didn't inform us or the consulate in Barcelona that they were coming to Spain, nor ask any help in their investigation. A highly experienced private detective with over 20 years work tracing missing people added, I can't understand why the Madeleine detectives would have released this story and leave it to the public without first making their own investigations in the port. It beggars belief that they did not speak to the owner of the restaurant or the port authorities. The McCann detectives had not even checked port records for the dates of the 6th and 7th of May, the days the British banker was in Barcelona. The Mail on Sunday, however, managed to see them, and traced nine boats that arrived in the port, one of which was unfamiliar. It was a £6 million Sunseeker powerboat, Willpower, owned by an Australian multi-millionaireess, Rhonda Wiley. The Mail on Sunday interviewed the captain. They commented, Mr Edgar's team are in the embarrassing position of having to explain why it was left to reporters to discover the boat's presence in Barcelona and trace its former captain. The Mail on Sunday article was interesting for another reason. The McCann team sought to blame Edgar's assistant, Arthur Cowley, for the Barcelona debacle. Asked to explain himself, Edgar said, We are a small team. Mr Cowley's company had no connection with the Madeleine investigation. I am employed by the McCann family and I pick my staff. In these words, Edgar had effectively blown apart the claim that he was the boss of the imaginary Alpha Investigations Group. He, not Alpha Investigations Group, had been hired by the McCanns, and Alfeg was Cowley's company, not Edgar's as the mainstream press had consistently claimed. There was also one truly extraordinary statement made by Dave Edgar at this press conference. He referred to the abductor. He said the abductor might have been a woman, not a man. The statement completely beggared belief. The McCann's close friend, Jane Tanner, had insisted that at 9.15pm she had seen a man carrying a girl in pyjamas near the McCann's apartment. She described his long, sleek black hair, his dark jacket, his mustard-coloured chino trousers and his black winkle-picker shoes. The description was given to the world. Only five and a half months later, a ridiculous delay, did the McCann team publish this artist's sketch of the man said to have been seen by Jane Tanner. The sketch was circulated worldwide, being represented as the man who abducted Madeleine McCann. How then could Dave Edgar possibly say that Jane might have seen a woman, not a man? Clearly this led to people wondering if Jane Tanner's so-called sighting was a complete fabrication. Despite the fiasco of their attempt to pin the abduction of Madeleine on a young Australian woman who looked like Victoria Beckham, the McCann team, with the help of Dave Edgar, continued to work on a series of highly improbable stories about what really happened to Madeleine McCann. Let's move on to look at just one or two of the unbelievable stories developed by Dave Edgar. One of the angles the McCann team and Dave Edgar focused on was the possibility that Madeleine might be being held in an underground prison lair. This followed some well-publicised appalling stories of how girls had been kidnapped and held for years before finally gaining freedom. There was the case of Natasha Kampusch, abducted by Wolfgang Pricklepil when 10 years old and held for 8 years before gaining her freedom. Then there was J.C. Lee Dugard, kidnapped by sex offender Philip Craig Garrido when aged 11 and held for 18 years before being freed. Then there was the evil Joseph Fritzl, who had held his daughter Elizabeth captive for 24 years and fathered 7 children by her. More recently there was the case of the three teenage girls held captive in Arizona for two years. 
Although the circumstances of what happened to these girls was very different from what the McCanns say happened to Madeline, this did not stop Dave Edgar strongly promoting what he said was his sincere conviction that Madeline was being held in a prison lair in the so-called lawless hills that surrounded the village of Priya de Luz, the village where she was reported missing. Despite these repeated claims, the McCann team never devoted any of the millions of pounds donated by the generous British public to make a single inquiry in the area. One storyline developed by the McCann team was to try to suggest that Madeline was abducted by a notorious British paedophile then living in Germany, Raymond Hewlett. He had, it is true, been staying in a camper van in Portugal, about 30 miles from Praia de Luz, at the time Madeline disappeared, but at the time he was in his late fifties, and looked nothing like the man said to have been seen by Jane Tanner. And there were other indications that he could not have carried out the abduction. Hewlett died in December 2009, but that did not stop another attempt in which the McCann team were clearly deeply involved to bring his name into the search for Madeline. Other newspapers quickly recycled the story on their front pages. I know who took Madeleine McCann, deathbed letter from paedophile suspect makes abduction clue claim. A paedophile suspected of being involved in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann confessed to knowing what happened to the little girl on his deathbed, it has been claimed. Raymond Hewlett wrote to his estranged son denying he played a part in the three-year-old's abduction, but claimed he knew she had been stolen to order by a gypsy gang. Cancer sufferer Hewlett, who has a record of raping and abducting children, had previously claimed to have seen the missing toddler twice before she vanished in 2007. The story was literally incredible. It featured Wayne Hewlett, a builder from Telford. The long-time estranged son of Raymond Hewlett. Raymond Hewlett had been convicted of a string of sex offences, and his son Wayne had disowned him over twenty years previously. But the son solemnly told us in an exclusive Hewlett whilst dying on his deathbed in a hospital in ancient Germany had written his son a letter giving information about what really happened to Madeleine McCann. Hewlett told the son that a mystery man had brought this letter all the way from Germany. No one has yet volunteered who this so-called mystery man might be. The letter, so it is claimed, said the man years ago Wayne's father had been sitting around a gypsy campfire drinking with a gypsy gang leader. The letter gave the name of the gypsy gang leader and said that the gang leader had admitted to Hewlett that members of his gang had stolen Madeline to order on behalf of a wealthy North African family who wanted a young white girl in their family. One would think that any responsible person would have immediately contacted their local police station and handed them the letter allegedly containing the name of this gypsy gang leader. Instead, Wayne said that he had become emotional about it and burnt it. Having burnt it, he later decided to tell the McCann team, or the son, about the story. We can't be sure which came first, but what we can be sure about is that the McCann team and the son cooperated once again to put this story on their front page on the 1st of September 2010. In this final section of our in-depth look at the Madeleine McCann case, we are going to look at a significant aspect of this case which simply cries out to be explored. And that is the quite remarkable extent to which the British government and other political, media and establishment figures at the very highest level have been involved in actively assisting the McCanns and in promoting their claim that Madeleine had been abducted right from the very first day Madeleine was reported missing. So let's begin right away by introducing all the top-level people who rushed out to Praia de Luz in the first week after Madeline's parents first alerted the authorities that Madeline was missing. In doing so, let us bear in mind that it was always possible that Madeline might have wandered off, or that she could have been recovered from wherever she had been taken. One presumes that all those who rushed out to Praia de Luz were doing so in a bid somehow to find out what happened to Madeline McCann and hopefully find her alive. But as we take a much closer look at who rushed to get involved, we begin to wonder quite what was the agenda of some of these people and groups. An obvious place to start is by looking at what consular help the McCanns received from the British ambassador in Portugal. At the time Madeleine McCann was reported missing, Tony Blair was the British Prime Minister. His Foreign Secretary was David Miliband. His Chancellor of the Exchequer was Gordon Brown. The Blair government was renowned for the fortune of taxpayers' money spent on his PR men, spinners, or as some have called them, professional liars. 
A key person in this exercise in controlling the media was the head of the government's so-called Media Monitoring Unit in the Central Office of Information. It reported straight to the Cabinet Office at No. 10 Downing Street. At its head was Clarence Mitchell, the very man who for the next seven years was to be the main point of contact for the media covering the Madeleine McCann story. As we saw in the first programme in this series, when asked what his role was at the Media Monitoring Unit, Mitchell answered without hesitation to control what comes out in the media, which is exactly what he has done for the past seven years. And we know from a Freedom of Information request that Clarence Mitchell was formally appointed to head up the Madeleine McCann PR campaign on Sunday the 6th of May, barely 48 hours after Madeleine had been reported missing. What was it, we might well ask, which was so important about this story that the head of the government's main media unit needed to be sent out to Portugal full-time to cover this story? What exactly was the government's interest? What could a PR man do to help find out what happened to Madeleine McCann? Another leading civil servant sent out to Praia de Luz was Sherry Dodd, a left-wing journalist who worked for the Daily Mirror before Tony Blair appointed her his Special Foreign Office Ambassador to the McCanns the very next day after Madeleine's disappearance. That now makes two very high up civil servants dispatched to Portugal within 48 hours. It was described in some media as unprecedented. Dodd had been a long-serving senior spokeswoman for the government. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office announced that she was being deployed as the press officer responsible to act as media liaison officer for the McCann family. She flew out immediately to be at the McCann's side for press conferences and to attend police interviews. Her instructions, so far as the public were concerned, were to offer every possible consular assistance to the McCann's. But it seems clear that right from the start her instructions were to do a lot more than that. Because of an international British government letter leaked to a Belgian newspaper, Le Denier Heur, this is what the Belgian newspaper informed its readers. 1. An unnamed diplomat warned the government in a letter of inconsistencies in the witness statements testimonies by Madeleine's parents and their friends about the night she was reported missing, adding people were not where they claimed to be. 2. After visiting the McCanns, the diplomat voiced concerns about the confused declarations as to the precise whereabouts of Kate and Jerry McCann and their friends in the final hours before Madeleine's disappearance. 3. The letter went on to comment on the McCanns' lack of cooperation with the Portuguese police. 4. The letter stated that a senior civil servant at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office had earlier suggested to consular staff that they exceed their authority and put pressure on the Portuguese authorities. 5. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London had commanded that British Embassy staff give all possible assistance to the McCann couple. 6. Diplomats were told the McCanns must be accompanied at all times during any contact with the Portuguese police by either A. a member of consular staff or B. by British police officers sent out from the UK. We will come to the nature of the British police sent out to Portugal in a moment. 7. The author of the letter warned London of the risks of siding with the McCanns as completely as had been demanded. It said, with the greatest respect, I would like to make you aware of the risks and implications to our relationship with the Portuguese authorities if you consider the possible involvement of the couple. Please confirm to me, in the light of these concerns, that we want to continue to be closely involved in the case as was requested in your previous message. None of the contents of this explosive report from a British diplomat have ever been mentioned in the British press. We cannot be sure who was the author of this damning report, but all indications suggest that it was the senior Foreign Office civil servant we mentioned just now, Sherry Dodd. We do know on the record that Sherry Dodd's work in Portugal came to a sudden end on the 17th of May 2007, just a fortnight after Madeleine's disappearance. The indications are that Sherry Dodd compiled her damning letter within a day or two of her arrival in Portugal. She seems to have been the one person in the entire British government who was bold enough to express any doubt about the McCann's claim that Madeleine had been abducted. In 2008, a Freedom of Information request was made to try and obtain disclosure of the contents of all communications between the British Embassy in Portugal and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London. This was denied on the grounds that the release of such information would in some way endanger or irreparably damage international relations between the UK and Portugal. The first government minister to get involved in the case was Gordon Brown. 
At the time he had been Tony Blair's Chancellor of the Exchequer for ten years. He was shortly to become Britain's Prime Minister. We know two specific things about his close involvement in the Madeleine McCann case in the first three weeks after Madeleine was reported missing. First, we know from Jerry McCann himself, and this has never been denied, that he made several mobile telephone calls to Gordon Brown himself. Don't you agree that there were a lot of details that in, cer in a certain way contribute to people to doubt of you? For example, uh, when you went to the Vatican so quickly, all the contacts that you've made. Can I ask you, Jerry, if you personally know Mr. Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister? No, I understand. We've never met Gordon Brown. I was talking to him once on the phone several weeks after Madeline was abducted. Second, we know that Gordon Brown leaned on the Portuguese authorities to persuade them to release a description of a man with a child that the McCann's friend insisted had been near their apartment at about 9.15pm the night she was reported missing. The McCann's and Jane Tanner had told the Portuguese about this alleged sighting in the hours following Madeline's reported disappearance. But the Portuguese police, right from day one, thought her so-called sighting was fabricated. They did not want to release details of this sighting as they thought it would mislead the public. However, it is known that Gordon Brown spoke on the telephone to the Portuguese authorities demanding that they allow Jane Tanner's sighting to be reported and asking for the public's help in identifying the suspect. And so it was on the 25th of May 2007, over three weeks after Madeline had been reported missing, that Jerry McCann and his PR spokesman Clarence Mitchell summoned the world's press to make this announcement. The Portuguese police later released the same description, but in a very low-key announcement. The McCanns had got their announcement, but no artist's sketch or e-fit accompanied Jerry McCann's description. That was partly because Jane Tanner said she had seen the man sideways on and didn't see his face. It was also dark at that time, 9.15pm. It was an almost unbelievable five and a half months later that the McCann team did produce an artist's sketch, and this was it. It was hard to know what good this would do so long after the event, and without a face. When the sketch was eventually released, the British press obligingly and uncritically published it on all the front pages. Of course, it didn't lead to anyone being identified, but it did powerfully reinforce the idea that Madeleine really had been abducted in the public's mind. But why was Gordon Brown so much involved in this? He was not the Foreign Secretary, David Miliband was. And why was the government so much involved as to seek to force an obviously very reluctant Portuguese police force to allow a description of a man which had every appearance of being fabricated released to the world? Why would Gordon Brown not allow the Portuguese police to get on with their investigation unhampered? As we shall see a bit later, Gordon Brown got even more involved when he became Prime Minister. Tony Blair resigned as Prime Minister on the 27th of June 2007 to make way for Gordon Brown. But he and his wife Sherry were in direct touch with Jerry and Kate McCann. In fact, as Kate McCann relates on pages 118 and 119 of her book, she took a call from Sherry Blair at about 5pm on Tuesday the 8th of May, just five days after Madeline's disappearance. According to Kate, Sherry Blair said it was amazing but encouraging that Madeline was still the first topic on the news every night. Sherry Blair also put her in touch with the controversial founder of Parents and Abducted Children, Lady Catherine Meyer. It was less than 48 hours after this conversation that on the 10th of May 2007, Tony Blair announced that he would resign as Prime Minister the following month. Let me now switch the focus to the holiday company used by the McCanns and their friends, Mark Warner. There was no obvious reason why Mark Warner should pull in some of the biggest guns available in the world of PR, but they certainly did. Mark Warner retained the controversial PR firm Bell Pottinger. Controversial, among other reasons, because they were hired at a fee of tens of millions of pounds to provide PR for the highly undemocratic Democratic Public of Congo. Their support for this repressive regime recently brought protesters outside Bell Pottinger's Fleet Street offices, campaigning against Bell Pottinger's involvement in supporting the odious regime.
Bell Pottinger is also paid tens of millions of pounds by other badly run African states. If Madeleine McCann had been abducted, it was not from a property owned by Mark Warner. Moreover, the McCanns had refused to employ evening childcare facilities laid on by Mark Warner at the Ocean Club premises where they were staying. They used neither the evening creche nor the baby listening service. Alex Wolfall, the head of crisis management at Bell Pottinger, one of the most senior men there, was dispatched immediately, arriving the following day on the 4th of May. Yet as we've been pointing out, as far as anyone knew at that stage, Madeline could have been found any day. How exactly the presence of the head of crisis management at Bell Pottinger could help in the police search for Madeline is not clear at all. One of the strangest things about this involvement is that no sooner had he arrived in Prior de Luz than he got hold of the McCann's cameras and began an immediate search for what was on them. He did so together with the McCann's relative from Skipton, Michael Wright. Quite why he did that is uncertain. One of the leading mysteries in the case is why the so-called last photo produced by the McCanns allegedly taken at precisely 2.29pm on the day Madeline was reported missing was not produced until a full three weeks later. Why, if it was on the camera on the 3rd of May, was it not released for three weeks? Why, in fact, did the head of crisis management at the powerful media relations firm of Bell Pottinger need to look at the McCann's camera at all? In her book, Madeline, Kate McCann gives an interesting, if selective, account of the events leading to Jerry McCann's emotional statement to the media at 10pm on the day after Madeline's reported disappearance. What is interesting is the sheer volume of important people milling around the McCanns by 5pm on the 4th of May, just 19 hours after the McCanns had first reported her missing, and just 8 to 9 hours after the first news reports went out on Sky News, the BBC and ITV. Helpfully, she lists some of them. Alex Woodfall, Head of Crisis Management, Bell Pottinger, Public Relations Firm. Top staff from Mark Warner in Portugal, John Hill, Ocean Club Manager, Emma Knights and Craig Mayhew. The British Ambassador to Portugal, John Buck. British Embassy Press Officer, Andy Bowes. The British Consul for Lisbon, Liz Dow. The local British Consul, Bill Henderson, with a colleague, Angela Morado. Alan Pike, a trauma psychologist from the Centre of Crisis Psychology in Skipton, North Yorkshire. Some of the McCann's relatives had already arrived, Kate's mother and father and her aunt Nora, who had cancelled a flight back to Canada where she lived so as to be able to fly out to Portugal. So far as support from the British Embassy was concerned, the support and level of backup in respect of a child who had been reported missing just a few hours ago was totally unprecedented. Why did so many of them need to be there? In addition to all the many people we've already mentioned, we need to look at the involvement of the British security services, an aspect which has rarely been mentioned in the British mainstream press, about which the government has been singularly evasive. Two men from CRG had discussions with the McCanns and were certainly there within days, despite Dr Gerald McCann saying in late May to a TV interviewer that they had no plans to employ private investigators. They were Kenneth Farrow and Michael Keenan. Mr Farrow is the ex-head of the Economic Crime Unit in the City of London Police and Mr Keenan an ex-superintendent in the Metropolitan Police with specialist fraud and investigative experience. The McCanns were asked if now that they had already netted £300,000 in their No Stone Unturned fund, they would use any of that money for private investigators. Jerry McCann responded, The advice we have received is that private investigators will not help at the moment. Despite this clear claim, a private investigation agency known as Control Risks Group announced in September that they had been helping the McCanns since May and were in regular contact with them throughout. In the early afternoon of Sunday the 13th of May 2007, Jane Tanner, one of the McCann's friends and the person who says she saw an abductor, spoke to some of the people Kate and Jerry brought in. She was referring to Control Risks Group. Who brought them in and who agreed to pay for them? Why were Control Risks Group brought in so soon? To find a missing child or for other reasons? The involvement of the British security services very often means that the government has taken a keen interest in the matter. So just what was the government's interest in the mystery of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann? Now we come to yet another government agency which was involved from day one, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Agency, or CEOP. 
This was an agency dedicated to the protection of children, especially from child sexual abuse, online grooming and child trafficking. It was absorbed into the National Crime Agency by the coalition government two years ago and no longer exists in a separate entity. At the time of Madeleine's disappearance, its head was the controversial figure of Jim Gamble. I say controversial because Gamble will forever be associated with Operation O, the investigation into those allegedly accessing images of child sexual abuse on a website. You could only access this website by paying by credit card online. A lot of UK users of this United States website was passed to the British authorities and handed to Jim Gamble and his team to investigate. Let's just go to Wikipedia and see what they have to say about Operation O and about its head, Jim Gamble. It was the United Kingdom's biggest ever computer crime investigation, leading to 7,250 suspects identified, 4,283 homes searched, 3,744 arrests, 1,848 people charged, 1,451 convictions, 493 people cautioned, and 140 children removed from suspected dangerous situations and an estimated 33 suicides. Operation O identified and prosecuted some sex offenders, but the validity of the police procedures was later questioned as errors in the investigations resulted in large numbers of false arrests. Its chief executive, Jim Gamble, was accused of using vague terms which do not have a recognised meaning within either child protection or law enforcement when they defended the operation. This accusation came from an article by Charles Arthur in The Guardian. Coincidentally, it was published on the 17th of May, just a fortnight after Madeleine's reported disappearance. Within days of Madeleine's disappearance, Jim Gamble, just like Alex Wolfall of Bell Pottinger, was on the hunt for photographs, without, it seems, asking the Portuguese police for permission. Gamble begged the British public who had been on holiday the week the McCanns were there to send their holiday snaps. Quite why he thought this would help the Portuguese investigation is unclear. Indeed, we don't know if he ever sent these photographs to the Portuguese police. But SEOP had another controversial role in the initial stages of this investigation. The coordinator of the Portuguese investigation was Dr. Gonçalo Amaral. He wrote a book on the case and he was controversially removed from the investigation. The book was called The Truth About a Lie, but it was yet to be published in this country because of a five-year-long libel action in the Portuguese courts by the McCanns to try and have the book banned. It is actually still on sale and has been translated into nine major European languages, all of them except English. In his book, Dr Amaral mentions how members of the British security services, including staff from SEOP, helped to build a profile of the likely abductor. These men, whose names we don't know, soon put the name of Robert Murat into the frame. We could do a full programme on Robert Murat's involvement in this drama, and perhaps we will. He had joint Portuguese-British citizenship and was fluent in both languages. He had in fact been a police translator for Norfolk Police. He spent part of the year in England, part of it in Portugal, where he had a German girlfriend. For mysterious reasons, he suddenly booked a flight to Portugal at midnight on the 30th of April 2007 and was at Faro Airport in the early hours of the morning. Early on the 4th of May, as news was breaking worldwide of Madeleine's disappearance, Murat volunteered to translate all the interviews the Portuguese police were doing of the McCanns, their friends and other witnesses. During these interviews, he acted so suspiciously and inappropriately trying to sneak a look at confidential police documents on the case, for example, that a police inspector sent an urgent report on his behaviour to Dr Amaral. Gossip about him was fed into the British mainstream media and lurid headlines about him started to appear. His arrest was partly triggered by the work the SEOP staff were doing. Dr Amaral in his book mentions that the staff from SEOP compiled a profile of the alleged abductor, compared that profile with Robert Murat and convinced Dr Amaral that Murat fitted their profile 90%. There is a big question mark about whether that was a genuine assessment or whether it could have been part of a calculated ruse to get Robert Murat made a suspect, as indeed he was on the 15th of May. Authorization for SEOP to become involved at all must have needed authorization at the very highest level. Just who gave the order for the men from SEOP to be sent to Portugal? Before we leave the subject of Robert Murat altogether, here are a number of things for you to ponder about him. Murat was pulled in for questioning on the 15th of May by police. 
In interview, he was asked to give an account of his movements from his arrival in Portugal on the 1st of May to the 4th of May, when he volunteered to translate for the police. During this interview, Marat told the police 17 blatant lies about his movements during those four days. Here is a list of them. How was he caught out? Because several weeks later, the Portuguese police had analysed pings from his mobile phone to local mobile phone masts. These proved that he was not where he said he was during those four days. When these were put to him in a second interview on the 10th of July, he asked for a break in the interview. After the break, he came back and told an entirely different story. He told the police that on the 15th of May, he had been too tired to tell the truth. One of those 17 lies was not to admit that he was in fact at the Palmeiras Golf Club near Lagos on the afternoon of the 3rd of May about seven hours before Madeline was reported missing. Now I've just pulled up at the Palmares Golf Club which is a few miles east of Lagos, maybe seven or eight miles east of Praia de Luz. The significance of this increases when we consider two other points. First, the mobile phone records of both Robert Marat and Jerry McCann show a most remarkable coincidence. At about 3 p.m. on Wednesday the 2nd of May, both men suddenly switched off their mobile phones within six minutes of each other. Their mobiles then each remained switched off for a further 32 hours until both men switched on their phones again at around 11pm in the evening on the 3rd of May, an hour after Madeline was reported missing. Again, they did so within six minutes of each other. That raises the question of whether the two men were already known to each other. Now it is alleged that Jerry McCann met with Robert Murat at this golf club uh, before, sometime before, Madeline went missing. So I'm just going to go in, take some footage of the outside and of the inside. Second, on this clip we see Jerry McCann, the day Robert Murat was made a suspect, asked a simple question. Do you already know Robert Murat? But did you know Robert Murat? I'm not going to comment on that. <clears throat> he doesn't answer the question. He could easily have said no if the answer was no. What does his body language suggest? In addition, he looks evasive. The question clearly troubles him. He looks away from the interviewer and hurriedly terminates the interview. If we knew more about the nature of any relationship between Jerry McCann and Robert Murat, we would surely be able to understand a whole lot more about what really happened to Madeleine McCann. But let us now return to the subject of involvement of government and other political, media and establishment figures in actively assisting the McCanns. Let's look next at the involvement from the outset of Leicestershire Police. It is far from obvious why the police force in the parents' home county in England should get involved immediately in searching for their missing child in a foreign country, yet this is precisely what happened in this case. Superintendent Bob Small and at least two other officers from Leicestershire Constabulary were dispatched immediately to Praia de Luz. Bob Small was to play a highly crucial role in the decision by the Portuguese police to pull in Robert Murat for questioning. He was directly involved in the events leading up to the controversial event. It was on Sunday the 13th of May, ten days after Madeline's reported disappearance, that Jane Tanner was asked to take part in an identity parade to see if she could identify the person she had seen carrying a child on the evening of the 3rd of May. Significantly, before taking part in this exercise, she spoke to Superintendent Bob Small. Jane Tanner was asked by the police to sit in an unmarked police van with a two-way mirror. She could see out of the window perfectly, while those on the outside could not see what was within. It was arranged for a number of people to walk past the van, including Robert Murat, who now was at least a potential suspect. As Robert Murat walked past the unmarked police van, Jane Tanner became adamant to the police that he was the very man she'd seen walking near the McCann's apartment ten days ago. Within 48 hours of Murat being made a suspect, three of the McCann's Tapas 7 friends visited the Portuguese police, saying they were sure they had seen him hanging around the Ocean Club around 11pm on the day Madeline was reported missing. Thus, four of the group were pointing the finger at Robert Murat. Why did they do this? Were they telling the truth? We can answer that in part by pointing out by the end of the year, all four of them were once again singing from the same hymn sheet. But this time, each one of them said that they had made a mistake and it wasn't Murat they'd seen. But these deep mysteries about Robert Murat will have to wait for another programme. So let's now look at another couple of people sent out on day one to help find Madeline, or perhaps for some other purpose. 
there were Alan Pike and Martin Alderton from a shadowy group called the Centre of Crisis Psychology, CCP, as their name suggests. Their claimed speciality was to offer counselling to people in trauma following some kind of disaster. These two counsellors were apparently brought in and paid for by Mark Warner, the company who arranged the holiday for the McCanns and their friends. A Yorkshire newspaper, the Craven Herald, reported on Monday the 14th of May as follows. The two specialist trauma counsellors from Skipton have flown out to Portugal to help the devastated parents of missing four-year-old Madeleine McCann. Consultants Alan Pike and Martin Alderton from the Centre of Crisis Psychology, based at Broughton Hall, have been by the side of Jerry and Kate McCann since their daughter Madeline was abducted. The two experts were appointed by Mark Warner, the company which manages the resort, to assist Mr and Mrs McCann, both 38, on how to best deal with the stress and trauma of their terrible ordeal. Mr Pike, who was leading the team, flew over to the resort with Mark Warner Managing Director David Hopkins the day after Madeline disappeared. Once again, the sheer speed which these people rushed out to Pry de Luz has to be questioned. The first news that Madeline was missing came out at breakfast time on Friday the 4th of May. Yet by the end of the day, the managing director of Mark Warner and two people from a crisis counselling group had booked a flight, booked accommodation in Portugal and boarded a plane to Farrell. It turned out that CCP had a very close relationship with the government, having been used by the government in a number of major disasters across the country. A Mark Warner spokesman said that CCP came highly recommended by industry partners and have been known to us for some time. Their experience in dealing with a variety of incidents is second to none. The Craven Herald said that Alan Pike has been involved in consulting with companies following road traffic accidents, personal attacks, terrorist bombings, shootings, robberies, drowning and staff bereavement. It was an impressive list. Amongst others to have used CCP was entrepreneur Richard Branson. Before the month of May was out, even the Pope was roped in to support the McCanns. This was on Wednesday the 30th of May, less than four weeks after Madeline had been reported missing. The Pope blessed a photograph of Madeline. There was worldwide coverage of this event. Such a high-profile event had clearly been planned well in advance, and it had been achieved by the work of the government-appointed media relations officer for the McCanns, Clarence Mitchell. He didn't actually fly out to Pride of until the 22nd of May, eight days before the McCann's visit to the Pope, but we can be sure that he will have arranged this event well before then. Indeed, Mitchell openly boasted in a TV interview that it was he who had arranged the McCann's to visit the Pope simply by asking the then Roman Catholic Archbishop of Westminster, Cormac Murphy O'Connor. Clearly, as the head of the government's media machine, Clarence Mitchell would have contacts with the most powerful people in the land, and without doubt, Cormac Murphy O'Connor was certainly one of those. The Pope's support for the McCanns extended to prominently publishing on the Vatican website the McCanns' appeal for people to look for Madeline. However, the Vatican has one of the best intelligence networks in the world, and just 48 hours before the McCanns were pulled in for questioning, the Pope deleted the page from his website. No doubt a Portuguese Catholic had tipped off the Vatican that the McCanns were about to be made suspects. In her book, Kate McCann praised Alan Pike to the skies. The effect our conversation with Alan had on us was truly amazing. To say it helped would be a gross understatement. Alan was and remains a saviour. Another shadowy organisation was ready to help the McCanns from day one, the International Family Law Group. This is how Kate McCann describes how they became involved. We received help from a paralegal based in Leicestershire, via a colleague of Jerry's. He worked for a firm specialising in family law, the International Family Law Group, IFLG. So on the afternoon of Friday the 11th of May, the paralegal accompanied by a barrister flew out to Portugal. IFLG suggested making Madeline a ward of the High Court, and they did so just a few days later, giving the High Court a range of powers in relation to Madeline, assuming she was alive. It was this unnamed paralegal and unnamed barrister who then suggested, according to Kate, that they set up a fighting fund. Quite who they needed to fight at this stage was unclear. Kate says that IFLG would devise the objectives of the fund and instruct a leading charity law firm, Bates, Wells and Braithwaite, to draw up articles of association. These two unnamed figures then brought in a third unnamed figure into the picture. Again, let's hear about this in Kate's own words. At the last two meetings with IFLG, the barrister and legal assistant were joined by a consultant called Hugh, whose profession was not at first explained, 
Just call me Hugh, he said enigmatically. It transpired that he was a former intelligence officer, now a kidnap negotiator and counsellor. We were told that an anonymous but evidently very generous donor had set aside a considerable sum of money for us to put towards hiring a private investigation company if we wished. Hugh had been brought in by a firm called Control Risks Group, which was primed to help. The company is an independent special risk company. Their main line is corporate security. The involvement of government and their agents is unprecedented in this case. But I'm going to go back and consider this alleged abductor. We have the evidence of Jerry and Kate McCann. Jerry says he saw Madeline alive when he did his check on the children at around 9.05 to 9.10pm that evening. Then, so it is claimed, Kate McCann discovered Madeline missing from her bed when she did her check at around 10pm. She maintained many times that she knew instantly that Madeline had been abducted. We know that the McCann's friends, the so-called Tapas Seven, generally back up the McCann's story of an abductor. But apart from them, what actual independent or forensic evidence do we have of an abductor? Is there any forensic evidence? Footprints, fingerprints, hairs, clothing fibres, DNA, anything in fact? Absolutely none. The only fingerprint found on the window was actually that of Kate McCann, suggesting that she was the last person to handle the window, sometime shortly before the police were called. So did anyone hear this mystery abductor, maybe lifting shutters, entering or fleeing the building, the noise of a child, anything at all in fact? Again, absolutely nothing. Did anyone see someone who could have been an abductor? Yes is the answer to that one. Two sightings of a man carrying a child were reported, one was by the McCann's close friend, Jane Tanner, who says she saw a man carrying a child close to the McCann's apartment at around 9.15pm that evening. The other one was a claim by members of an Irish family that they saw a man carrying a child in a different part of the village at about 10pm. There are serious question marks over both of these alleged sightings. Firstly, it is possible that Jane Tanner fabricated her sighting in order to help her friends, the McCann's. There is also some doubt over the Smith sighting. This is because they did not report it until a full 12 days after Madeline had been reported missing. This 12-day period might be significant when one considers that Martin Smith, who reported the sighting, was friends with Robert Murat. The sighting was reported shortly after Robert Murat was arrested 12 days after the disappearance. We could add a lot more detail on these two sightings and why there are serious question marks over them. But we'll leave that for another show. There are many more aspects to this case that we haven't covered, but hopefully we've given you a broad understanding of the facts behind this case. Many of you will be wanting a clear answer as to what most likely happened to Madeleine McCann. Unfortunately, we can't give you this. In this final part of my films on the Madeleine McCann case, we've seen the heavy hand of government involvement right from day one. We've examined the involvement of the security services and of shadowy agencies like Control Risks Group and the Centre for Crisis Psychology with their obvious close contacts with the government. When we looked at Gary Hagland, we saw how he contacted one of his old friends in MI6. It's also become clear to me how far MI5 have been involved in this case, though this has never been adequately covered in the mainstream press. The original investigator in the case, Gonchalo Amaral, spoke in his book of the active involvement of MI5 in meetings in Portugal during the first few days of his investigation. We mentioned the vital evidence of police sniffer dog handler Martin Grime. He told Gonchalo Amaral that on his way back to England he was intercepted by a member of MI5 at Faro Airport. Most likely the MI5 officer wanted Grime to brief him about what he and his dogs had detected in prior to Luz. We looked at the employment of Kevin Halligan and Oakley International. Halligan employed the services of two men, Henry Exton and Tim Craig Harvey. Exton obtained a Queen's Police Medal for his work in the Ministry of Defence, was awarded an OBE and, most significantly of all, was the head of covert intelligence for MI5. The McCann spokesman himself boasted in 2008 that all these men were top ex-MI5 men. So without a shadow of a doubt, MI5 was involved, heavily involved, 
in the government support operation on behalf of the McCanns. There's one obvious question. Why? Was it just because the McCanns or the McCanns' friends had connections with people in high places? Was it because the British government was perhaps concerned about the reputation of Britons abroad? Or could it have been something else? Let's just highlight one of the dubious activities of the intelligence agencies, highlighted by former London Mayor Ken Livingstone. I was raising in Parliament against Mrs. up against Mrs. Thatcher, the Kinkora Boys' Home, where boys were being abused, and MI5 was filming it because they were hoping to be able to blackmail senior politicians in Northern Ireland. We believe there are certain secrets concerning the activities of the intelligence agencies which cannot come out. They cannot be brought forward into a court. Is it the case that if the real truth were to come out in a trial, the state would have to fall?